afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the talk on internationalization. Uh, just quick FYI, if you can't really see the screen super well, I know like the contrast isn't great. I have posted these slides on my Twitter, so you can go on the Liberty JS website, find my Twitter, and if it's easier for you to follow along on your laptop, welcome to do that. So my name is Robin, and I work for a company in Austin, Texas called Talia. And at Talia, we currently support 18 different locales in our application. So I've been learning what it truly means to internationalize an app, and there were a lot of things that I didn't know that I didn't know that I wanted to share with you all today. So the reason I chose this topic is not necessarily because I'm an internationalization expert, but because I have a lot of experience being on the other side of things when it comes to poorly internationalized applications. So as English speakers, as Americans, we're very fortunate that most of the web is built for us in mind. So we don't often know how frustrating and confusing it can be if you are a person who doesn't speak English and is trying to find something out on, on the web and you can't find anything that's in your language and you're really frustrated, you're really confused. And so I wanted to come here today to show you what you can do to alleviate that confusion and frustration for those non-English speakers or those non-Americans that could potentially be using your application. So I wanted to cover the following today. So first of all, what is internationalization? How is it different from localization and globalization and why is it important? Because there might be some of you today who are like, well, my app is uh, just local to the US or local to my city. I know I'm only going to support it in English. And so I want to explain why there are still some aspects of internationalization you should worry about in your application. I'm also going to show you how you would set up translations using an internationalization framework. Now, I'm a React developer, so I'm going to show you the React flavor of this library called IoT Next. However, if you're a Vue developer, Angular, Ember, don't fear. This library actually has, uh, it supports multiple frameworks. So I'm just going to go through the React one because that's what I know, but I'm not going to go too deep into React code. Finally, I want to go beyond translations and explain things that you should look out for when you're internationalizing. So this is really the part of the things I didn't know that I didn't know, part of the uh, talk today. So, okay, so first of all, what is internationalization? There are three words that come up a lot with this topic, so internationalization, localization, and globalization. And just as an FYI, you'll see this in my talk and then also online if you research this topic, we shorten it down to I-18N because there are 18 letters between I and N, in the same way that we shorten accessibility to A11Y or Ally. Those are called new learners, just a quick FYI if you haven't seen that before. So we've got internationalization, we have localization, and we have globalization. So how are those things different? So let's say we're starting an application from scratch. Uh, and we know right now that we're only going to support it in English, which is totally fine. We can still begin the process of internationalization. So what I mean by that is as you're building out your application, say you have a component that has a date. And if you are in the US, you would probably format your date to be month, day, year, because that's how Americans generally format their date. If you hard code that in, that means that component is not properly internationalized. It is not prepared that if in the future, this a person from the UK or Europe was um, looking at your application, it would not show the proper date format for them. So internationalizing is just this process of going component by component, seeing what is specific to that region and how it can change. And so we generally do internationalization first, and that is where most of our focus as developers are going to be. Now, localization is the process of adding a locale to the application. So say your PM comes to you two years later and says, all right, this app is doing great. Let's add Spanish support into there. And so you add the Spanish translations. You pass in um, ES into your functions that format the date. You do everything to support Spanish. And then two years later, you localize again because you want to add German. And so you can continue to localize and localize with different locales. However, hopefully you've done such a good job at internationalizing everything that you only do that process once. Now, globalization is this entire process together. It's this umbrella term for internationalization and localization. And so because internationalization is the preparing to localize in the future, this is what I mean by you can have an application only in English and it's still internationalized. It just means that in the future, if you were to support another locale, you could do that with minimal um, frustration. 
So another way to look at that, localization is kind of what you see on the surface, and internationalization is everything that goes on um, under the surface. And again, as developers, most of what we are going to be doing is the internationalization side of things, unless you are fluent in a language and you offer to support by adding um, some translations or offering to proofread, probably most of your work is on the internationalization side of things. And I've also used this word locale, and I just wanted to clarify what I mean by that. So we often don't want to support an entire language. And the reason is we know as American English speakers that American English is different from English from the UK, which is different from English from Australia. And the same is true in, in multiple languages. So Spanish from Mexico is different from Spanish from Spain. And so oftentimes we want to specify which region we're supporting. And so we use the word locale. And specifically, we use things called BCP47 language tags to identify languages. And this is what you're going to pass in into any internationalization framework or any date time library. They will expect it to be in this format. So you have a hyphen there that will separate the um, language and the region. And for languages like Chinese that have simplified and traditional, we want to specify which, which kind of Chinese that we're using. So I've kind of given you the what is internationalization, so I want to talk about the why. Why do we even need to worry about internationalizing? So I've got two graphs here, and don't worry if you can't read the stuff at the bottom. Just kind of look at the shapes of the graphs. So on the left, we have languages found on the web, and it is highly, highly skewed towards English. So um, English is found on more than 50% of the languages of the web, but if you look at the graph on the right, um, English speakers only make up 25% of internet users. So there's a lot more content out there available in English than there are people who can actually speak and write in English. And if you look at um, the second one, so on the graph, the second bar, the second highest is Chinese speakers, which makes up only almost 20% of internet users. However, they're not even in the top 10 of languages found on the web. So there's obviously this huge skew towards English and there's not as much content out there for people who don't speak English. And as uh, years go by, this is only going to, um, the percentage of English speakers is only going to shrink, and not because people who speak English are going offline, but because the people who don't have internet access that are going online generally are coming from countries that don't speak English. And so it's, there's only going to be more and more people coming online, looking for things online to use, and not finding it because they don't speak English. They weren't fortunate enough to learn English. And so you might think, okay, this makes sense on a global perspective, but in the US, we actually have 21% of people here, or 64 million people, who speak a language other than English. And in fact, we have 25 million people, or 8.5%, who speak English less than very well. So even if you know your app is only going to be used in the US, never going to be used in the other countries, you are still missing out on 8.5% of people in the US if you're not offering Spanish or whatever the second most used languages in your region. And I've been kind of talking about this on like a business and a financial standpoint, but I believe it's also just something we should do to be a good person. So we talk about accessibility in terms of people with visual impairments or physical disabilities, but internationalization is also part of accessibility. So I believe that internet is a basic right for everyone, and everyone should have access to the internet and be able to find things uh, in their language. And so if we're only um, supporting English in our languages, we're denying it to those people who can't speak English. So next you might be thinking, okay, I'm totally down to internationalize, um, so all I need to do is just Google Translate, right? And probably most of you know that the answer is no. You cannot just use Google Translate. And I mentioned I lived in China and Taiwan, so I would experience this all the time where I would go to a, uh, a restaurant, I'd open up the menu, and I would see something that was like fried roller skate meat, and I'd be like, okay, what? What does this even mean? Um, so Google Translate's not gonna cut it. It does work for like short common phrases, so you know, things like submit, enter, and actually on Google Translate, you'll see like a little check button that says it's a verified translation. So that's totally fine, but like, once you get into these longer strings, it, Google Translate's not gonna cut it, or whatever machine learning you're using. Uh, a machine can't understand context, you need a human actually translating. And you're gonna end up with things that are confusing, or incorrect, 
or just downright inappropriate. And if your app is a professional application, you want to make sure that your translations aren't that. You might end up with something like beware of safety, which I saw this all the time in China when I was hiking. Um, child shredded meat. Uh, eat your fingers off if you're going to KFC. Or you go to wash your hands and you see a sign that says, use the clean to invite powerful water. So you, you don't want your application to look like something like this, because Google Translate's just not going to cut it. Okay, so I've explained what is internationalization, why you're going to use it, and so let's say that you have decided that you are going to internationalize, and you want to choose an internationalization framework because you've decided you want to support more than just English in your application. I'm going to show you how to do that with a library called IAT Next. So IAT Next, as I mentioned, it's not just a React-specific library. It does actually support Vue, Angular, Ember, um, some backend languages like Node and PHP. And I like this um, framework for a variety of reasons. So first of all, it, when you're shopping around for internationalization frameworks, there's some certain things that you want to look for. So for example, you want to, to be able to support plurals. And I'll go into more depth what I mean in a later slide. Uh, interpolation. So what I mean by that is if you have a string, um, oftentimes we have just you know static text, a uh, string of text, and that's fine. But sometimes we want dynamic content. We want to pass in a variable in there. We want to pass in an anchor tag in there. And so we want something that is going to allow us to interpolate something into the translation string. But I also like this library because it has a plugin to detect the user's language from the browser. And you never want to force a language on a user. You don't want to assume that just based on their location, they speak that language. People are traveling. When I lived in China, I mean, I could kind of speak Chinese, but my written uh, Chinese was awful. I couldn't read it, so I wanted it in English. So you don't want to force a language on a user. However, the first time they come to your application, you don't know what language they're speaking. And so using something like a plugin to detect the browser language can be super helpful until that person can actually go and choose their language. Um, it also gives you the ability to load and cache your translation. So if you have a small application and you have these translation files, you can definitely put it in a JSON document and, and bundle it with your application if it's small. But that's not going to scale. So if you have a large application, you probably are going to store them in a third-party service, or maybe you have them in your own database and you're pulling them in with an API, you don't want to load those every single browser refresh. And so loading and caching them and having the ability to lazy load them can be really helpful. Uh, finally, I like that it's flexible and scalable, so it's going to work um, you know, for smaller applications and larger applications. I'll show you a smaller application. So let's say that we want to make a Hello World app that is translated in English and in Spanish. Super easy. So as I said, I am going to put these translations in just a JSON file that is bundled in my application. It is small, so it's totally fine to do this for a small application. And what I'm doing is I'm putting EN for English and ES for Spanish. I'm not going to specify the region because this is just a really simple demo. And then I'm going to call it greeting. I could have called it whatever I wanted. I just need to make sure that they're called the same in both languages. Now, again, I'm going to show you some React code, um, but probably if you're using Angular View, you're going to do something similar. So you need two different libraries, IAT Next and React IAT Next. I'm importing them both, and I'm importing my translations from that JSON file that, again, I'm keeping in my uh, project itself. And then I initialize it here by passing in the, the translations. I'm going to hard code in here that I want to start it with English, just for the um, sake of simplicity. And once I've done this, my entire application now has access to these translations. So in my, in my React component, all I'm going to do is render a span that says hello world. Now if this was not internationalized, I would probably just type in hello world. But because we want to internationalize it, we want to support English and Spanish, um, I'm going to use this uh, with translation um, to, that I'm pulling in from React IET Next. So I do this, I'm passing in this higher order component with translation and passing in my class into it so I have access to this translation function. That's that T function. And again, any IAT9 library that you're using, we'll probably call it T. Uh, and you pass in the path to the translation. So if you recall, I called that greeting. So I pass in greeting, and what's going to happen is it'll pop out and say hello world. 
Um, and then if you are familiar with hooks, um, you could also use a um, use translation hook, so it's even easier than if you're using a traditional class. Um, you do the same thing. You pull out this T function from this use translation hook, and you no longer need to use this higher order component. But let's say that Hello World and Ola Mundo is just not enough for us. I mean, we do want to make it a little bit more dynamic. We want to pass it a name. So in that greeting, I've now changed it. So now it doesn't say Hello World. It says Hello Name. So now, in my, so going back to my functional component that's using hooks, instead of just saying greeting, I'm passing in the name, Robin. And so that now, instead of saying Hello World, it's going to say Hello Robin. And I've done this all in English, but say I wanted to have a button that was the toggle of the languages. So in the same way that you can pull this T function out, you can also pull in the IATNN object out. And that IATNN object will let you do lots of things like load more translations or change the language. So here when I click this button, um, IATNN.change language, and then I pass in the locale that I wanted, it's going to change it so it says hola Robin. And again, this is for your entire application. You don't have to go component by component and change the language. It just has this global state that it knows what language you're in. So here's a little bit more on setting up your translations, because what I showed you is pretty basic. When you are setting up those translation files, you need to make sure that you don't make assumptions on grammar based on what you know in English. So this can be kind of tricky because most of us probably learn high school Spanish, and Spanish is pretty close to English. You can get, kind of get a bit away with, with certain assumptions, but once you get into languages like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, the sentence structure is completely different. So if you concatenate something in English, like say you have one large string and you split it in two and you concatenate those two together, it might work in English and Spanish and French, but then once you get into languages that aren't really Latin-based, it's probably not going to work. If you look at my example here in Korean, you can see that the sentence and structure is completely different. So it's just better to have that entire translation stream and then interpolate what you need. Um, and then I said I wanted to talk about plurals. So plurals are really tricky. In English, we have a rule like this. If you have zero of something, you add an X. If you have one of something, you don't add an X. If you have two or more of something, you add an X. And the same is true in other languages like Spanish. So again, I'm saying sometimes you can get away with doing the same things with English to Spanish or English to Portuguese. Um, but the same is not true in all languages. So for example, so all these locales here are locales that I work with. So Japanese, Korean, and Chinese all do not have a plural. So um, if you have one of something versus two of something, it's going to be the same noun. Then if you go into that third row, Czech and Polish actually have three forms of plurals. And that fourth one is Slovenian. It has four forms of plural. And I don't speak Slovenian. I don't know the rules. It might just be like zero is something, one to four is something, five to ten is something. I'm not really sure. But I don't really need to know that because this framework will take care of that. And how that works is, so say you have a translation cat. And I mostly did this because I wanted an excuse to show off my cat in the um, Handmaid's Tale outfit, because I was just really proud of her. So say you want to translate cat and cats. So if you look back at the English chart, so English is the two plurals. So what I team N um, expects is this thing and thing plural. So I'm going to have cat and cat plural in my translation file. And then when I translate cat, I'll give it a count. And it always has to be the variable count. You can't change that. And so if I give it a count of one, it will know to pass out the singular form cat. And if I go to count five, it will know to pass out the plural form of cats. And this is great if you have multiple locales that have different numbers of pluralization. You just don't want to figure that out on your own. All right, so I want to go beyond translation because not everyone is going to support multiple locales. And I did say that even if you have an English application, you can still have an internationalized application. And I want to explain why. So probably the first thing that comes in mind with internationalization beyond translation are dates, times, calendars, time zones, and numbers. So the first problem arises here. Okay, so if I give this date, 01, 02, 2019, to a group of Americans, probably most people will respond, oh, that's January 2nd. Now, if I give this same date to a group of people from the UK, and I say, what is this date? They're going to say, this is February 1st. So here's your first, like, glaringly obvious 
there's just something I need to work on even if I am supporting English, because it's going to be really confusing if you are uh, shipping your app to countries outside of the U.S. Another thing is in the U.S., we tend to prefer a 12-hour clock, whereas in other countries like Germany, they prefer the 24-hour clock. Um, if anyone's ever worked with time zones, you probably have, uh, you probably resonate with this white shrew gift. So time zones are super confusing and super frustrating, and it's not even just the time zone map of one to another, which is very confusing. It's the fact that some time zones observe daylight savings time, some don't. The ones that do observe it don't always observe it on the same day. And the countries that observe daylight savings time, like the U.S., don't always observe it in all parts of the U.S. They maybe only observe it, um, like in the U.S., I believe we don't observe it in Arizona, I think. So yeah, sometimes in, in one country, you will support it and not in, not in other states. Um, and also sometimes things can be like on a 30 minute mark or the 15 minute mark, so it's super tricky. Uh, calendars can also be tricky. So in the U.S., we would expect a calendar to start on a Sunday. However, if you're from the U.K., you would probably expect your calendar to start on a Monday. And I've definitely looked at this European calendar and been very confused because I just assumed that first column was Sunday, but it happened to be Monday. Another issue is numbers. So say I give you this integer here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0.78. And I ask a group of Americans, hey, can you format this number with commas and decimal points? What they would probably give me back is 1, 2, 3, comma, 4, 5, 6, period, 7, 8. Now, if I asked a group of people from India, they might format it like this. 1, comma, 2, 3, comma, 4, 5, 6, period, 7, 8. If I give this to a group of people from Spain, they might format it like this. 1, 2, 3, period, 4, 5, 6, comma, 7, 8. And this is just three of the many ways that countries format their numbers. Um, I just wanted to show these examples. You can see, especially if you compare U.S. and Spain, that that can be really, really tricky. Um, also, how you display a percentage can be different. In the U.S., we put the number and then the percentage. In Turkey, they'll swap it. They'll put the percentage and the number. Um, some countries prefer a space between the number and the percentage. Currencies can be really tricky. So if you are talking about the word dollar, um, it could be a U.S. dollar, it could be a Canadian dollar, it could be an Australian dollar. There's all sorts of dollars, and you want to make sure that that currency makes sense to that person there. So we've given you all these problems, but what is the solution to these problems? And I'm going to say this a lot of times in this talk, but the point is do not reinvent the wheel. Do not try to um, solve these problems yourself, because as you add more and more locales, it's just too tricky for one person or one team to, to uh, tackle that problem on their own. Make sure to use open source libraries that have already solved these problems. And because we've been talking about dates and times and formatting them and, and formatting numbers, what you can use are, there's a lot of great date time libraries out there. So traditionally, a lot of people have used Moment.js, but I know there's kind of this pushback to use Moment.js because it is such a large bundle size. So there are other ones out there like DateFNS. In fact, when I was looking for different libraries out there, there is a whole GitHub repo called You Don't Need Moment.js. So if you don't like Moment.js, there are tons of alternatives out there. Um, one that will allow for tree shaking, because I know that is another complaint of Moment.js. Um, but just keep in mind that some of the reasons that the bundle size is so big is because of time zone support, which is a very complicated thing to um, solve. So if you're not using time zones, definitely use one of those smaller libraries. But if you are using time zones, you might have to pick something that is a little bit larger of a, a bundle size. Uh, another solution out there that is just a native JavaScript API, you can just open up your uh, dev tools and start playing with this right now, is something called Intel, I-N-T-L. So this gives us a lot of things. So we can give you things like a relative time format, so like one week ago. It can give you list format, so like, do, does this language use commas or do they use something else? Number format, like I showed you earlier on the slide, with US versus India versus Spain. And then it gives you plurals. And when I say plurals, I don't mean that it solves like the plural issue that I, I showed you earlier. I mean that it gives you um, words you can use like few or many in different locales. So here's some examples of Intel. And again, this is just not something you download. This is just something that is um, a native JavaScript API. 
So you could do something like new, intel, relative time format, and here I pass in that BCP47 language tag we talked about earlier. So I want to have the relative time format for Spanish from Mexico, and I want to format it to be minus one month, so one month ago, and it's going to spit out Asaili names. Then, uh, the, the example at the bottom, I'm doing new intel number format, I'm passing in JA, which is for Japanese, and I want to have a style of currency and the currency of Japanese yen, JP, JPY. And then I've given it a number to format, 172630, and it passes back this number formatted, it passes back the correct currency symbol and how somebody from Japan would prefer to see that currency style. Uh, and I should mention that because it is uh, dependent on the browser, it's going to work fine in Chrome and Firefox, but if you are supporting um, Internet Explorer, maybe don't put a lot of, uh, use a lot of Intel functions. Um, but beyond that, just some final tips dealing with dates and times. Make sure to stay consistent. So I've actually worked at a company where sometimes we've been past the date already formatted in the API, and sometimes it would um, just be a timestamp. And it could be really confusing. So what I would recommend is to store your dates in UTC. So if you don't know what UTC is, it stands for Coordinated Universal Time. And it's basically like the standard we've agreed upon, that this is zero. This is, um, we can have a time zone that is eight hours ahead of UTC or four hours behind. And so storing that in UTC can make things a lot clearer. And then you can always format those with your preferred library on the front end. And then the same with, um, Integers, there's no reason to store those pre-formatted in your database, like just store them as integers and then have the front end format them as so. And then finally, if none of that works, so I know this is a super old meme, but I really want to bring it back because I really like it. You can just invite Ryan Gosling to your office and he can go, hey girl, did you lose a timestamp? Because I'm pretty sure it's datetime.now. Really, I'm sorry, but I just really want to be putting some Ryan Gosling in there. Uh, and then finally, as I was going through all of this, I was just kind of like, how do these libraries know all this? Like, where is this information coming from? So the answer is this, the CLDR, Common Locale Data Repository. So this is um, a project put on by the Unicode Consortium to provide locale data. And I mention this not because this is something that um, you're going to interact with directly. You probably never will. It's just something that's kind of um, use behind the scenes. A lot of those libraries I've missed, uh, I listed earlier probably have this as a dependency somewhere. And it's got a lot of things. It's got translations for language names, so how do you say French in French? Country and territory names in their language, currency names, time zones, calendar fields, number patterns, and more. So I just, this is just an FYI. This is not something you're going to be working with. All right, so the next issue that you might come across are non-Latin characters. And what I mean by that are just talking about things that aren't just the standard A through Z alphabet. So you might have seen something like this, especially like back in old internet days. This means that someone is using a non or probably means that someone's using a non-Latin character, but they have not properly encoded um, for their characters. Um, you might have seen something like this too. So this is again driving from the point that even if your app is only in the US and only in English, there are still some things that you need to think about. So somebody who lives in the US and speaks English might have a name with a non-Latin character. And you don't want to have a form that validates and tells them that their name is invalid because they don't have that. So if you're, um, yeah, if you, if you have people with, with names like this, you, you want to make sure that you are checking for all characters, not just Latin characters. So solution to all this, first of all, encode your characters properly. There's a variety of ways to do this, but as front-end developers, you can um, put this in your HTML and your meta tag, just set it as char set equals UTF-8. You can also set this in your HTTP headers. Use Unicode if you can. Um, Unicode is great because not only does it support like A through Z ASCII characters, but it supports Japanese characters, Chinese characters, emojis, Arabic characters. Um, and be aware, if you do accept non-Latin characters, of how you're sorting things, because it's not going to work with a traditional A through Z sorting. And also be aware what your regex is checking for. So with this example that I had earlier, we were probably using a regex expression that checked um, just for 
the alphabet of A through Z, but if you are sure about it, you can go to regex if you like. Uh, so the next problem that we might have are, is designing with only English speakers in mind. And this is more of a UX thing, more than a developer thing, but I still think it's important to think about. So I'm here to make an assumption that most of us are probably developing in English first, and then if you decide to add another language later, you are doing that after you have coded everything in English. So perhaps you're making a save button. And you've measured out how many pixels the save button is, and then you decide to add Spanish. And suddenly, that does not fit anymore because that does not take up the same space as English. And this is going to happen all the time. So here's an example. I've got the word use in English. And I have a chart here of the ratio of comparing that length of the string from English to another language. So with Korean and Chinese, it's pretty close. Like, you're not going to see a big difference. But when you get to Portuguese, French, and German, it could be three times as long. And for some reason, it is always German that has these really long strings. I don't know why. I actually asked my friend who lives in Germany, who's married to um, a German person, to ask me, or to tell me all super long German words. And so he gave me these as an example. So like, I'm not going to try to pronounce these because I don't know German. But uh, yeah, translating from English to German can be really tricky UX-wise. So how do we solve for that? Make sure, and again, this is more of a UX thing, but be aware. Allow for enough flexibility in space that translated text is going to fit into your design. So I found this rule of thumb online. If your English is fewer than 10 characters, leave room for three times. So you saw that example with the German being three times as long as, as English. But if you have like a really long thing of text, you don't need to leave room for three times. You can leave room for like 30%. Again, it's just a rule of thumb, not a hard coded rule. And then for us as developers, if you're the person who's writing a CSS, don't use fixed widths. Don't measure out how much space it takes in English and then assume it's going to work in other languages. Keep your CSS flexible. All right, the next issue is supporting right-to-left languages. So this is probably not most of us, but I still want to bring it up. So some right-to-left languages out there are, probably the big ones are Arabic, Hebrew, Persian, Farsi, and Urdu. So if you are going to support a right-to-left language, there are a lot of things you're going to do. I don't have that much time to, to go over that in this talk, but just like a brief overview. Um, here's a left-to-right language like English. Um, we've got the Wikipedia logo on the left side. We have buttons at the top right that say create account login. We have the cat stuff, the cat pictures on the right side. Then if we look at it in Arabic, you can see everything swapped so that Wikipedia logo is now on the right side and those login buttons are on the left side and the cat pictures are on the left side. So like everything's swapped. Um, even like the icons are often swapped. Um, so how you would do this is by going into your HTML. You can also do this in CSS, but um, in HTML you can add DIR for direction equals RTL. So again, RTL stands for right to left. LTR is the standard, so you don't have to set it if, um, if you are using the left to right language. And this brings up that if you are using something like float left, that float left will stay float left, both in left to right and right to left. So everything's going to be swapped. Your left is now right, your right is now left. But the CSS doesn't know that. The CSS is going to keep it on the left. So if you're using like text align left, float left, it will stay left even though you want it to be right. So how you can get around that is by using something like Flexbox. And we should probably be using tools like Flexbox or CSS Grid over floats anyway. But it's really important in the case of right to left languages. If you use something like Flex Start, it will start in the correct direction. It's not going to stay stuck on the left side or the right side. And this also brings up that we should be naming things based on what they do, not what they look like. So an example of something that I've done in the past is I had two pagination arrows. I had um, left arrow and right arrow, and I called it that. But I shouldn't have called it that. I could have used something like previous and next. Previous and next makes sense in both left to right and right to left, whereas left to right can get really, really confusing really fast. So if we use vocabulary like before, start, beginning, backwards, above, that can be really helpful because it's going to make sense no matter what direction you're looking at. So finally, I had some things that didn't really fit into any of those categories, but I did want to bring them up. 
Um, you should make sure you're always adding a language tag to your HTML. If you are a React developer and you want to dynamically update that, you can use this, um, this library called React Helmet that will help you to dynamically update your language or your direction, your DIR. Be careful with your routing. So if you dynamically add your routes, you cannot have Chinese characters in your uh, URL. So if you're dynamically naming those routes, that's going to get confusing really quickly. So make sure you have a plan if you are going to have um, multiple languages and um, dynamic routes. Be careful with your fonts. So if your font looks good in English, it's probably going to look good in Spanish and Italian and French, but it might not look good in Korean and Thai because those characters are different. And the font you're using, if it's like really obscure, they might not have those characters in that font built in. Uh, make sure that you know that one character can have meaning in some languages. So in China and Taiwan, they, um, the last name is often just one character for one syllable. And so, if, again, if your regex is saying, like, hey, this must be two or more characters, just know that um, if that person is using a Chinese character, that their last name is probably only going to be one character. Um, you can go to um, this W3 validator, and this is not like a perfect thing, but it is just nice to kind of see like what violations you have. Like I know they have a lot of uh, A11Y checkers online that will tell you your accessibility issues, but this one can help you to check out your internationalization issues. So it can be a really good like first step if you don't really know what to do. So here are my final takeaways. So first of all, design your app to be language, region, and culture independent. Try to use open source projects to help you solve problems that you didn't even know existed. And just keep in mind that globalizing means bigger markets, more inclusiveness, better code that's more extendable and easier to manage. If all that you didn't listen to, just try to keep in mind to be like Pitbull, Mr. Worldwide. And that is all I have today. Um, I have my slides on Twitter uh, if you want to find them. So it's just my first and last name. I actually have some resources here that won't be good for you to take pictures of because they're links. But if you want to learn more, like have more in depth into things like right to left language, bidirectional algorithm, um, all that's on there. And so, and I also wanted to say thank you to my Uber driver last night. So this is the first time I've been to Philadelphia. I don't know if this is normal, but I really like it. And I'm really thankful that he did not murder me last night because otherwise I would not be here today. So special thank you to this Uber driver, whoever you are. Uh, I appreciate not being murdered. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much.